Right, so a couple years ago, my beautiful mother here got my family into beekeeping. And as you can see, we got lots of delicious honey, but less than a year later, she went into the hive and she found that a lot of the bees had these deformed, uh, decrepit wings. And within a few weeks, the whole hive was dead. Unfortunately, she's not alone either. Last year, New Zealand lost 10% of our beehives. The US, over half, some places as high as 84%. 70% of the produce in our supermarkets are at least partially dependent on bees. And when we compromise that level of produce, our horticultural communities could collapse. There's less food options, which could price out the poorest people in our population from the healthiest foods. In turn, that could have massive effects on our social infrastructure and even our health. So when the bees go, so too does one of our fastest growing industries, honey, or our one and a half billion dollar kiwifruit industry. But most losses would actually be seen by our largest export, dairy, right here. Bees pollinate pasture crops like clover and lucerne, which act as natural fertilizers for the grass. Without them, farmers have to use these expensive synthetic fertilizers, which can actually leach into the waterways and pollute them. Also, since the year 2000, our wild honeybees, well, they've been almost completely eradicated from New Zealand. Our native bees are dying more than ever too. A 2013 study actually claimed that these wild bees are more effective and efficient pollinators than the, than the domestic hives we're already using. So who knows the impact that this could have on some of the thousands of plant species pollinated by bees every year, let alone the ecosystem as a whole. Okay, so what's causing this terrible, terrible problem? Most experts will tell you it's this guy, Varroa destructor, and its associated viruses. When it sinks its teeth into the bees, it sucks up their immune and energy cells, and in the process transmits a slew of viruses to the bees, resulting in these crippling birth defects, and in turn, a slow death. Science Research Journal has called deformed wing virus a global pandemic. Okay, so since Varroa was introduced to New Zealand, we've basically used these two chemicals as a treatment, amitraz and pyrethroids. Problem is, resistance is starting to develop. And uh, so some places, application rates have quadrupled, and soon they won't work at all. In fact, in the last decade, resistance has begun right here in New Zealand. Not only that, but they've actually been shown to be chronically toxic to the very bees that they're trying to protect. Okay, so what, what, what if instead of targeting the mites, we target the viral problem itself? Well, you'll never guess where the answer lies, but introducing the kingdom fungi <laughs> <laughs> for the fourth time tonight. <laughs> the great biochemists of planet Earth, they, uh, we've utilized some of their antimicrobial properties in the past, and this man, Dr. Paul Stamets, thinks we can do it again. As probably the world's most reputable fungi scientist, he designed a simple but very rigorous experiment. What he did was he, he made a raw, unprocessed broth from these fungi here, added it to some sugar syrup, fed it to them, some bees, and measured the changes in these viruses. Let me tell you, the results were incredible. All four fungi tested showed marked reductions in all viruses tested. The reishi mushroom showed a 45,000-fold reduction in the lake Sinai virus. Incredible. What, the bee lifespan? Well, that doubled. The, uh, we, we still need to do some science to ch check out the uh, safety of residues in honey, but it seems very likely, very likely that they're non-toxic, considering their history. The ancient Chinese name for reishi is lingzi, meaning the mushroom of immortality. They are, modern science says this too. They say it upregulates the immune system, lowers blood pressure, lowers cholesterol, promotes sleep, reverses liver damage, decreases pain and arthritis. It reduces cancer growth and spread. It uh, reduces, you name it, it, it reduces herpes virus, influenza, swine flu, smallpox, <laughs> even HIV. This mushroom supports a fundamental hypothesis about the future of medicine and nutrition. I support Dr. Stamets in saying natural products have broader benefits with less adverse effects than pure pharmaceuticals. 
And it makes perfect sense too. Nature has spent billions of years sculpting solutions to target these problems from multiple angles, whereas most synthetic chemicals are just targeting one or a few pathways. So <clears throat> I talked to a man called Phil Lester, who's uh, one of our country's lead bee researchers at the Victoria University. And he agreed that this multi-angled approach could really set a fungal solution apart, especially when it comes to solving the major problem of resistance. More science is needed, but this is how the theory goes. Because pharmaceuticals have such a one-dimensional attack on the mites, the mites can very quickly evolve a defense rendering the drugs completely useless. On the other hand, a fungal solution bombards the viruses from so many different angles that they simply can't keep up. And in turn, resistance takes far, far longer to develop. Exactly how these fungi target the, uh, target the, target the viruses isn't quite clear. We do know it upregulates the immune and detox pathways. It might block viral uptake into, the, into cells. But again, we may never pinpoint a specific mechanism. It's actually far more likely that there's a vast array of compounds that target many points in the process. Okay, so let's say it works. To, an, to establish an industry, for this really to be successful, we need to know three more things. We need the industry knowledge, we need the materials, and we need to know if it's even wanted. Well, Phil Lester again, that uh, New Zealand bee expert, said it's not wanted. He said, we desperately need something new. And beekeepers would welcome a solution that's more natural. He said this is a great potential option. It's very simple as well. This is uh, putting sugar syrup in the hives, very common practice, uh, basically ubiquitous. You do it either side of winter. And when you do this, you just simply add one part mushroom broth to a hundred part sugar syrup. So sugar syrup, very simple. Uh, yeah, so um, in East Asia, a multi-billion dollar industry actually already exists for, this, for cultivating very similar mushrooms. The difference with them is they are using the mature mushroom, whereas the broth form needs the immature mushroom. I read a complete industry review, and it said this. It said, the broth form yields faster growth, higher production, easier processing, and lower costs overall. So, considering we're using this uh, raw, uh, a natural product as opposed to a refined pharmaceutical, we're using the cheaper and easier broth form, and uh, a hive probably consumes about a teacup's worth in a whole year, I'm very confident in saying that this solution will be cheaper than current mite products. A couple years ago in Thailand, they successfully cultured and grew uh, the, one of the very mushrooms Paul used in his study that I mentioned before. That's it right there, about 55 days after inoculation and less than a kg of sawdust. Now, this was quite incredible for me to find out. But this very mushroom species here is actually New Zealand's most common native bracket fungus. And 7% of our land mass is covered in pine forests producing tons and tons of sawdust, the perfect substrate for cultivating our own native abundant fungus. Wonderful, great. Okay, so um, will, the, will this idea actually benefit society though? Or is it just another commercial or personal endeavor? Let's find that out. So in 2002, uh, a study estimated the cost of Baroa to New Zealand for the following 35 years at about half a billion dollars. Indeed, yes, this is a lot of money, but it's actually only the tip of the iceberg. This study included the cost of treatments, the increase in pollination costs, and the conferred loss in production. What about the massive increase in industry size since 2002? 800% for honey. What about when resistance causes a five-fold increase in treatment costs like it already has elsewhere? Or what about when we can't afford healthy foods? or when we get sick as a result? What about the impact on our environment? New Zealand benefits from one of the most beautiful and productive environments on Earth, and bees are behind its most crucial step in survival, that's pollination. Who knows the losses to our biodiversity? But considering bees uh, offer us over $200 billion in pollination directly worldwide, what they offer the environment as a whole is it's truly unfathomable. 
Not only that, but a fungal solution is unique. It's actually one of the only intensive farming practices which doesn't degrade, but actually uplifts the environment. It uh, fertilizes soil, feeds animals, uh, reduces waste. It consumes pollution. Okay, but what is most important? As Karen said, it's actually the people, he tangata, right there. So, so uh, being surrounded by a, nat uh, a beautiful natural environment, especially one as sensational as our own, is actually proven to be a major predictor of good well-being, as is having a rich and connected social environment. Nature, agriculture, and horticulture form the fabric of the Kiwi way of life. We depend on bees. Without them, we compromise the well-being of our beekeepers, our gardeners, our farmers, our horticulturalists, but not only them, actually all of us who benefit from the wealth that nature provides. So to conclude, a fungal farming solution to the bee crisis is profitable, it's environmentally uplifting, and it reinforces the social fabric and well-being of our nation. So maybe, just maybe, more of humanity's most complex problems require nature's complexity for their solutions. Um, Louis or Lewis? Lewis. Have you? <laughs> well, either or. I don't whatever. Mind. Whatever. Yeah, I can call you anything you, you like. You can call correct? me anything you want. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you tested out these fungi on your mother's bees? No, I haven't yet because um, I think there's, there's uh, a bit of uh, knowledge which I don't have required to create this broth. I think it's like, like the quality control measures and creating something which is consistently useful uh, would probably require a more extensive uh, industrial factory setting with actual chemists <laughs> as opposed to a naive fool like me. <laughs> You are a fourth year vet student, though, aren't you? Yeah, but not an uh, industrial chemist. Let's hope chemist. you're not that much of a naive <laughs> fool. <laughs> For the sake of all our animals. Um, Paul Stamets is, is not an uncontroversial figure, and his claims have largely been unsubstantiated by science. Is that correct? Uh, I don't... I, I mean, he's controversial in the sense that... I, I think there's something inherent in being a very prominent figure that... that uh, maybe Maybe not inherent, but... Being such a prominent figure, he's, he's definitely open to criticism, and he does receive criticism. And I think, uh, fr from what I've aw I'm aware, and at least the studies that I've looked into, he's actually a very, uh, he's a very reputable and rigorous uh, scientist. And, and, yeah, yeah. And, and you've seen the results of his studies? Yes, absolutely. Done independently or by him? I, uh, how, how do you mean? Studies, I've seen done, I've... studies done independently or by him? So uh, I've looked at the research by him, and it's, it seems to fit in very well with the surrounding uh, literature. On well, the, it would, on the wouldn't subject. it, if it was by him? Has any independent study been made of his claims? This one in particular is very new. So it's actually, he is one of the only researchers at the moment that is, uh, that is talking about an antiviral fungal solution. In fact, he's actually got a patent on it. So I don't think other people can, can be using that product. But in terms of the, the other stuff, what I meant to say before is that of the stuff I've read of his, the surrounding literature from other authors seems to, uh, his, his work seems to jigsaw quite well into that, to be quite substantiated. Thank you. Thanks.